All right. Well, welcome, welcome. We will try to start on time here today. Um, my name is, as I said before, is Stephen Frost. I um, work with Laura at this part of the Atlas Institute. I'm the faculty director for the B2 Center for Media Arts and Performance there at the Faculty Institute. I'm also assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies and an artisan weaver and so excited to be here this morning. Um, for our second in the experimental weaving talk series. Of course, this experimental weaving talk series um, is a series where we at the Unstable Design Lab invite some of our favorite folks to give talks and, ta and specifically looking at their practice and how it relates to aspects of experimental weaving. And then this morning, um, our esteemed guest is gonna be introduced by the amazing and incredible and one of the, my favorite people, the Unstable Design Lab, um, head of our Unstable Design Lab, Laura. Um, just a second here, just admitting a few more people. Thank you so much. I'm doing double duty as like a warm up host and as the admin here for our Zoom here today. Um, I also just wanna point out uh, here in our Zoom joining us uh, is Etta Sandry, our current artist and resident. Hey Etta, will you give us a wave? There they are. Hi Etta, awesome. <laughs> um, and we're so happy to have uh, her here in Colorado. All right, handing the floor over to the esteemed Dr. Laura Devendorf, which I love saying, even though Laura's like, nobody calls me that. <laughs> I, th I think I've told you my mom calls me that. <laughs> On every package she sends me, it says to doctor, which is very sweet. Um, so anyway, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm so excited to have the pleasure to introduce Catherine today, um, maybe to help set up the space. Um, and see where we all are. We're all in this Zoom space, which can be kind of disorienting. So if you wouldn't mind just dropping something in the chat to say hello, and maybe where you're calling from, and everyone knows, you know, what your favorite snack food is, because it's always fun to know what different snack foods are around the world. Um, that will help us get a sense of who's here collectively in Zoom. Uh, we are also live in my class. <laughs> So you guys get to wave now. Yay. Uh-oh, somebody's coming in late. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, cool. So we're seeing lots of people coming in. I'll change to my camera. All right, so I'm back. Cool. So cool to see uh, people eating Twix in Germany and Northern Ireland and gummies in Colorado. Very healthy, Stephen. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and get this started. So it's my honorable pleasure to welcome Catherine Walters as our second speaker in the Experimental Weaving Talks, which is a series we started because we gave this residency a name out of a hunch of what we were looking for, but we don't really know what that is. And so we've been inviting in weavers that embody what we implicitly feel is experimental and trying to see if we can collectively draw out what a group as a group what that means um catherine is uh i don't even know how to say kind of like a rock star in weaving the most complex mind bending structures that i've ever seen um, i've had the pleasure of meeting with catherine almost monthly since january to develop features for adacad and think about how we can make that work and it's just been such a pleasure to try to get inside her brain and to learn about the sort of magical maze of threads and structures that exist in there. So I'm so excited for her to share her work today. Uh, logistically, she's a PhD researcher at the Swedish School of Textiles at the University of Roros. <laughs> I tried to roll the O. Um, and she's collaborated on a number of amazing projects focusing on the geometry of textiles, but also on things like zero waste structures. And I'm going to turn it over to her to really help us understand the process more deeply. But please join me in sending some claps to the chat and in this room to welcome Catherine. <laughs> All right, Catherine, I'm going to stop sharing so you can share. Stop share. Okay. Bear with me, my, bear with me one moment while I get this going. Okay. Um, sorry, I've just, there we go. Okay. 
Um, um, hopefully, everybody can see gotta... my... Can everybody hear me and see me and see my presentation? Uh, sorry, was that? Could you see that? Because I couldn't hear anybody. Okay, great. Sorry, yes, that was fine. Okay, sorry. Because yeah. of the way I've got this set up, I actually can't see anybody else's video. So oh, no. <laughs> that's why. Okay. All right, I'll 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 speak loudly next time. Um, we'll get that to go now. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. That's all right. Oh, I said that's all right to you, even though it was our fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, this looks great. Okay, thank you. Okay, no. um, so as Laura said, I'm Catherine Walters. I'm a PhD student in textile design at the Swedish School of Textiles, part of the University of Boros. It is a bit tricky to say um, here in Sweden. I am a New Zealander. Um, and I moved to Sweden to do my master's in textile design, and I'm about halfway through my PhD now. Um, thanks to Laura and Stephen for inviting me to give this talk, and thanks to all of you for joining. I'm going to talk about my practice, the tools I use, and the types of experimental weaving I use in my practice. Um, because I'm a PhD student, there's also going to be some kind of high level thoughts and models and diagrams about the way I work with textiles. Uh, I learned to weave about eight years ago at the Hand Weavers and Spinners Guild in Melbourne in Australia um, on an eight shaft table loom. When I started my master's degree here, I was introduced to industrial power looms, uh, both Dobby shaft looms and Jacquard. And my practice is really based in working with layers and volume, which is something the jacquard looms here really enable. Um, and I'll talk a bit about those soon. So these are some examples of my work from my master's, which was a master of fine arts and textile design. With this work, and this continues in my ongoing practice, I was aiming to develop three dimensional woven forms. So weaving that could enclose volumes but that started out flat on the loom. And I did this by combining stiff and shrinking yarns in the weft, often in separate layers. So in these examples, I was using um, either polyester or polyamide monofilament as the stiff yarn and elastic as the shrinking yarn. Uh, so I was exploring some pretty, some basic geometries, relationships of scale, pattern, that kind of thing, just seeing what sort of topologies um, and morphologies I could get out of these combinations. Um, later in my master's, which was a two year master's, I started using a paper tape yarn instead of the monofilament, which gave me quite different behaviors in the textile. Um, so in this top image, I've used a wool yarn as well instead of the elastic. And then it's gone through the wash, which has felted not only the wool, but also the paper. And because of the, the arrangement of weave structures in the top layer, it's enabled me to get this kind of arch shape when it's dried hanging upside down. And then because of the materials, it's stiffened enough to hold its own form. So I'm kind of starting to work with these kind of almost architectural forms. Um, and then below, I worked with molding the paper yarn because it stiffens when it's wet and then dried. But then I realized that if I put the right patterns, if I gave it space to kind of almost break in particular ways, I could get it to self-support. Um, and again, this, this one uses elastic, but it's, it's the kind of this combination of the structure and the material. There are a couple of key themes or ideas that came out of my master's degree that are really driving my research practice now. One of them is the idea of behavior in textiles. Um, I use behavior, the term behavior, in a way that is partially synonymous with properties, um, but it also expands on that. How does the textile move, feel, change? Uh, so in my master's, I was looking um, primarily for form generating or one-way transformative behavior. 
And as you'll see towards the end, I'm now expanding that into reversible behaviors um, and areas associated with smart or animated textiles. Uh, so the other related concept is the idea of emergent behavior being something that can arise in textiles. In this context, emergent behavior is something that comes from the textile as a system, uh, which is made up of different components and that is sensitive to small changes in starting conditions. So in this example, these are four pieces cut out of the same width of woven textile. They were woven on a four repeat loom. So the loom produces four exact copies of the same thing side by side as a continuous strip. Um, and that means they have identical materials, weave structure, so on. But when they've been released from the loom tension and separated, they've taken on quite different forms. I think you can see that pretty clearly. Uh, and this has to do with elements like the different tension across the loom width, the bending radius of the monofilament yarn compared to the width of the repeat and that sort of thing. Um, and that really fascinated me because uh, the typical impression we might get from industrial production tools is that they produce consistent, reliably same things. But my practice shows that you can kind of subvert the sameness and produce difference within a system designed for repeatability if you're working with the material and structure and they interact in certain ways. Uh, so I'm going to, because this is about experimental weaving, um, I've got this model that I started playing with during my master's and I've kind of kept adapting it um, as I'm going on. It's really what this is, um, is a way of organizing my thinking about the types of experiments I do. Uh, I consider all my work to be experimental weaving. I'm trying to find ways to develop and expand the field of weaving, so doing things that haven't been done before or new ways of doing things. So this model is about what mindset I bring to a particular experiment or set of samples. So what am I trying to achieve? I'm going to break it down. So this kind of this first stage of systematic exploration uh, might be what the term experiment means for some of you. It's about minimizing competing variables and seeking an understanding of a property or properties or behavior. This particular example is from a current project, um, a collaboration with some other researchers, where we're looking at how we can create three-dimensional woven textiles through felting. Uh, and in this case, um, machine felting. So not felting where we're controlling the felting action, but actually letting the textile determine the felting. So in this initial experiment, we're working with three different types of wool yarn. They've either got a high twist, a regular twist or a low twist, and that affects the way it behaves in a felting context. And then each of these yarns has been woven in um, five different weave structures from a plain weave, which is very tight, it constrains the feltability to a very loose satin, which gives the fibers lots of room to move and felt together. Um, so we're really looking at, you know, what is the combination of these things? So the top picture in each set is this is before it's felted, after it's been woven, and then here it's um, uh, here it's been after it's been felted. So you can see that there's kind of the spectrum of different behaviors depending on the parameters of either the yarn twist and the weave. And so the idea is that. Um, we can take this information and we can design a textile that we weave flat, but that becomes three-dimensional when it goes through a washing machine felting cycle, based on the location of the type of yarn and the weave structure across its surface. Um, and then the next stage in this model is design space exploration. So this is about um, kind of finding variations to broaden uh, a particular idea. Um, so these are a couple of examples from my masters where I was looking at basket weave variations and kind of the limits of what would hold together and how that would behave. So they're kind of they're related samples, but they're not they're not controlled. Um, and then this last type is formally design, and that's really where you're designing a thing and you want to get to a certain point. Um, and like I said, even though this is quite uh, kind of almost product orientated, 
because the projects I work on, they haven't really been done before, um, I still consider it to be very experimental. So just to briefly go uh, talk about the relationship between these around the circle. So I think of the fact that, you know, you can use systematic experimentation or systematic exploration to give you information that can then be built on to let you explore a design space. And it might offer an idea of where to start or suggest a what if. Um, and then this design space exploration might be refined towards a particular idea or an outcome. And then you're doing a focused design task. You're iterating down and narrowing the possibilities, whereas um, the design space exploration is about broadening the possibilities. And then, of course, sometimes when you're doing something new, you might stumble across something really unexpected, or you might want to understand what's happening a bit better, and that could lead you back to systematic exploration. So this is a model, like I said, that I use for myself for a way of kind of organizing my thinking. Uh, of course, um, the way we do things are really shaped by the tools we use. I'm really, really lucky to be here at the Swedish School of Textiles, where we have an amazingly well-equipped weaving lab. Um, to start at the kind of the simpler end of things, I guess, um, which isn't pictured, we have, I use some 24 shaft arm um, computer controlled hand looms, which I use for small sampling, um, especially some of the systematic exploration, like the felted samples I showed earlier. Uh, on the left is a cotton warp industrial jacquard loom, which is what I used for most of my master's work. Um, this one has four repeats uh, of 40 centimetres, so about 16 inches, and it's uh, warped at 33 ends per centimetre, which uh, I think is about 84 ends per inch. And on the right is our new Jack Adler, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, this is warped in polyester, and it's got um, 91 ends per centimetre, so that's about 230 ends per inch on the warp, which is insane. Uh, it's full width loom as well, so there's no repeat. Um, and I've just started working with this. So the high warp density is really useful for multi-layer experiments. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of what it's like working with these looms. I'm going to show you a short video so you can hear and kind of understand a bit about it. Uh, so it's quite a, it's actually quite a physical kind of tangibility to working on these looms because they're very loud. Um, you actually kind of estimate density by placing your hand on the fabric as it's being woven so you can feel how the reed's hitting the edge of the fabric. Um, I really love them. <laughs> so one of the things about working with these looms is that they don't use shuttles like a hand loom does, but they have a, a couple of rapiers that pulls the weft across the width of the loam and then it cuts it. So it's a difference from hand weaving. Uh, my wefts all have to go edge to edge and they're all cut. And I realized watching Melanie's talk a couple of weeks ago that some of her work, she's turning the shuttle partway across the warp. So she's able to create these hyperbolic surfaces, which I thought were amazing, um, but actually not something that I can do with these looms. So it's interesting, you know, again, this thing of, the tools you're using have different possibilities. So in order to run these looms, I have to program them. Um, so my design process tends to start off with sketches and notes, and I do these kind of last cross sections. These are my primary design tool, really, um, where I'm color coding layers and looking at where they're going and then breaking them down. And I've also started using paper models uh, to look at layer arrangements and proportions. And um, on the right, you can't read it, that's fine. It's a snapshot of a spreadsheet. So I use spreadsheets to organize the elements for each of my weaves. Um, and uh, in this one, I've got the artwork included. So the artwork is a, is a map for the Jacquard software. Each color represents a different wave structure. And the, that determines things like the layer arrangements and the warp and weft interlacements. 
this is the software that I work with here. Um, it's called ScottWeave, and it's designed for these industrial jackhard limbs. So in the design phase, I'm combining the artwork file with uh, each weave structure to generate um, a combination and overview of the whole width of the loom. And then that um, can be converted into a file that the loom can read. And in this file, each line tells the loom which warps to lift and also which weft selector to use. Um, so the loom file dictates which warps are lifted in the weft selectors. And so while I'm at the loom, I can change the weft density and I can change which weft yarns are on the weft selector. But it's still, it's very much driven by the work that's been done before. And the other nice thing about Scott Weave, it is it gives a limited amount of 3D graphics. So um, in this example, which is from an unrelated project, by color coding the weft, so I can actually check to see are they separating correctly? Are they in the right place? Is it the right structure? Kind of thing. Uh, but a big part of my design process is building out the bindings or the weave structures for each technical color. Because of the way Scott Weave works, this is done as a full layer stack and kind of independent of the other bindings and the rest of the design. And that's why I use the spreadsheet so I can understand where everything sits together. Um, so Scott Weave has its own weave editor, which gives generates the 3D views, but that's only good for up to three or four layers and not so good if you're combining layers and patterning. So um, I kind of got to a point where it couldn't handle the sort of things I was trying to do. So I wound up doing my structures in Photoshop <laughs> um, where I could color code things and use patterns for layer separations. But either way, both of these methods are all about pixel clipping. And so it's been really exciting to work with Laura um, on AdaCAD because uh, it's just a completely different way of doing things. And it's really, I think, opening up the possibility for me to do things in, that are more complex, but in different ways. Um, so one thing I found really interesting with this is it's forced me to think really hard about how to get the result I need. So in the other software, um, the algorithms for things like layer separations, compound waves, that sort of thing, they exist in my hands. Um, there's a tacit knowledge about how to go about pixel clicking in the right way to get certain results. And so even though it's time consuming and more potential for errors, it's something I just do. I don't really have to think about it so much. But AdaCAD requires me to translate that tacit knowledge into formal operations to kind of convert it into language rather than movement or patterns. Um, but by doing that, I really expose the logic behind these layers and the structures and the way they're built up. And it makes it much easier to troubleshoot, generate variations, and just generally manipulate elements. Um, which in a pixel clicking environment you tend to do by starting from scratch. The point I want to make here is that software can be quite directive and it has the potential to shape the way we work and design and think. I think it's really valuable to reflect on that. Um, I definitely think my practice has been shaped by the way I need to work with Scott Weave. Scott Weave makes it easy to chunk up a design and think in terms of just the layers at play in a particular section. And so I can plan a design at a high level and then work with the chunks in a very focused way that lets me do some quite complex outcomes because I don't have to think about the whole. So this is one of the projects that Laura mentioned in the introduction. Um, so this is a project I did with Holly McQuillan and Karen Pedersen, who at the time were both PhD students in fashion design here in Bordos. Um, we did it under the banner of critical textile topologies and we've got a website for our um, collaborative work there. So this project was designing zero waste woven garments for a film by Liam Young called Planet City. And um, there's a couple of things going on here. One is that they're woven as kind of the whole garment, zero waste, so it has to be a rectangle and you don't throw any of it away. But it also includes surface patterning and colors. So I'm gonna try and be really quick with this. So, oh, uh, this is the process that we go through when we do our collaborative works, the three of us. Um, Karen designs a small form, which represents the space between the wearer and the garment, and she 3D scans it. She passes this on to Holly, who figures out how to 
embed a slightly simplified version of the form into a layered rectangle. So something that can be woven. So through a process she calls flattening. And that gives us a digital text up form or a digital form. Uh, and then while she's doing that, Karen makes a full scale mold. And then the flattened rectangular design is programmed for weaving, either by Holly in these in the case of this example, or for the Planet City garments. I did those. And once woven, um, they are uh, they have to be cut to release areas like sleeves, which are fully incorporated. Um, and then they they include a um, sorry a heat shrinking yarn. Um, and so they can be shrunk on the mold to produce the final garment. Uh, so here is one of the examples, a tunic or a dress. And so you can see this is what uh, it looks like when it's come off the loom. And then the sleeves are cut open. So this edge is separated from the layer structure, from the flat fabric. And there's another cut that's made on the inside here for the armhole. And then you can kind of see this edge here is this edge where the layers are joining to create a sleeve. So it's very clear. Um, and the fun thing about this is when Holly mentioned this project to me, I thought this is fantastic. You know, we can do placement prints, we can do all sorts of things, but really weave them into the garment. Um, what we did was kind of all over patterns. Uh, and what we discovered is that the complexity gets exponentially more difficult the more elements you add to it. So doing this kind of zero waste woven garment is pretty tricky. Doing it with patterning is a bit crazy, actually. Um, it was really tricky. <laughs> uh, I won't go into too much more detail. It's been a while since I did this project and I think my brain has blanked out parts of it, but it's my own good. Um, so I'm going to talk about this dress, um, which is also from Planet City. So this rectangle um, separates into three pieces, which are overlapped to create a front and two back pieces. And then there's five seams. These areas that have the blue outlines are actually um, a three layer pleat. So they are cut along the edges and then they unfold. And that's what gives you all this volume in a rectangle that's about 1.5 by 1.5 meters, which I guess is about five foot by five foot. You get something that has a circumference that's three times the size of three, six, might be six times the size of the original um, rectangle, just by layering all these elements up and then cutting them out. So one of the things I learned from this process, uh, working with fashion designers, was the constructive potential of cutting. Uh, as a textile designer, as a weaver, I tend to think of cutting as a destructive process. It's cutting into the fabric. With the zero waste flattening method that Holly developed though, layers need to be released from the woven rectangle through cutting, but these are designed into the weave. So it's cutting to unfold, it becomes constructive cutting. Uh, and that led me to this piece, which I call Penguin. Um, this is a relatively complex form, but it's developed from a very simple woven geometry. And it's based on that three layer pleat that Holly developed for the dress and that I implemented. But it's done in the materials that I was using for my masters. So this monofilament and then a shrinking yarn. This shows you a kind of cross section of the structure. So here's the pleat and here's the pleat opening. And then this red layer at the bottom is a heat shrinking yarn that kind of closes it down. Um, it comes off the loom looking like this. And then these areas are cut to release the pleats. And then um, it can be kind of pulled out uh, to create a form, to give it real three dimensionality. And then they, because the pleats are woven in monofilament, they kind of start to fight each other, um, which is where the behavior gets really interesting. Uh, and this photo might show you why I call it penguin. And for me, the form is the relationship between the structure, its geometry, its weave, its materials, and a little bit of manipulation by hand. Uh, so this is going to lead me to this idea of textiles as systems. 
This is um, a conventional hierarchical view of textiles as a system. So fiber, yarn structure, textile construction through to finishing. This does ref reflect the manufacturing process, but it's not how weavers design woven textiles. This is a draft and um, you don't need to read everything in it, but it's just to give you a view. This is me mapping out everything that I can work with as a textile designer. So if I'm looking for textile behavior, I can, I have to think about things like what are the, what's the loom I'm working with? Uh, what are the warp and the weft yarns? What are my structures? What are my densities? What is the surface going to be like? How am I going to finish it? Um, so it's a lot more deep than you kind of the view you get with that simple kind of conventional um, thinking. Practically though, I can't keep all of that in my head all at once, although I do in some ways. In practice, these are the three elements that I'm foregrounding um, in any given experiment. I'm probably focusing on one and letting that lead the other two, but these are the three that I kind of juggle as a designer. So this last project I'm going to show you is one that I made for bio-inspired textiles. Um, this started with an idea about the structure based on that three-layer pleat that Holly developed and that you saw in the dress and in Penguin. But I wanted to do was to find a way to let this layer stack unfold flat. So I'm going to show you a video. So this is the three-layer pleat. And then this is the structure that I developed. Um, and I did this as part of the bio-inspired textiles maker collaboration. Um, after I developed this little join, I, I'm going to go back to that model of experimental weaving because I actually cover all three areas. So I did some systematic exploration, um, looking at what happens when you have different angles of the joins and also if you put tooth joins in, that kind of thing. Um, so I built up an information base about how this join uh, behaves. And then I also did some exploration of the design space. What types of pop-up boxes could I make with this join in a very kind of simple way? So these are two of the ones that I made. Um, I also made one that had a base that unfolded, but it was too long and a bit, um, bit floppy. It was, didn't really work, but these two worked quite well. Uh, they're just based on the simple join repeated a lot of times and then how can you make a box that pops up? And this was the final outcome of the project. It's, I call it a twist box. Um, this is a little stop motion video of where it started and through to its final form, which is this box. Um, I like to compare this with Penguin because Penguin has a relatively simple geometry and structure, but quite a complex form. Whereas the twist box has a complex geometry and structure, but a really simple form, like a box. You can't get much simpler than that, really. But to develop it, um, I went through a number of stages. So first I made this little white paper box that I squashed to figure out how it could be folded flat. And then I made um, a much bigger version in colored paper, including the tabs I needed for the woven joins and a different color for each of the eight layers required. And then for each zone of the artwork, each technical color, I wrote down what each layer had to be doing, um, how they were all related in order to turn them into weave structures. This is the final artwork. It needed 46 different structures in the end. So for this little box compared to, I think it was six in Penguin, you kind of begin to see that the results aren't necessarily, they don't translate directly to um, how complex it is to make something. Uh, I don't normally do iterations. Um, norm, like if I do iterations, I'm trying different things. But this project was sufficiently complex that I actually needed five tries to get all the structures and their placement right. Um, you can see, like I could tell from version one that I was on the right track but it was very fragile and it wanted to fall apart and some parts weren't opening very well. 
Um, even in the final version, there are some corners that are really fragile because the angle of some of the joins leave only a small length of weft. Uh, I have thought that this could be solved by weaving it on a hand jacquard loom like the TC2, so using shuttles, creating a close salvage, but it would require juggling eight shuttles and some quite complex yarn path mapping, and I don't know that I have the patience for this one, so it's also, you know, it's been, like, I've shown I can do it. I'm kind of not interested in it yet to develop it further because I know it can be done. Um, so uh, this just shows you how it unfolds. Um, one of the reasons I did a box for this project, which seems like a really simple thing, is to demonstrate the potential of this join. Because if you can make a box, you can make anything. So this kind of this layered structure plus this join it kind of um this is an illustration of the potential of it my last slide uh so um this is where i'm going next essentially this is at the very early uh systematic exploration stage so these are um cellulose yarn so that first one was viscose and then the next two are linen and then the two on the left are cotton and I've added extra twists to them and this is just room temperature water and so I'm getting different behaviors just from the yarn in the satin structure and what I ultimately want to do with this is explore how I can control the behavior of this yarn and then start to put it into three-dimensional textile how can I use this to, um, to kind of complexify my textiles? And the really nice thing about the linen is that when it dries, it actually straightens out again. So I want to start playing with ideas of reversible, responsive textiles. Um, so I'm starting to move into the smart or the animated textile space with that. My last comments, um, just to kind of wrap up. Weavings Weaving is about 24,000 years old. Um, a consequence of that, that having that technology around for so long is that weaving is really embedded in society. It's got a particular place. It's so ubiquitous that it's almost invisible. It primarily gets used as a material for design or a material to cover things. I'm interested in what weaving can do when the textile is a thing itself. What other potential is there for weaving that we haven't explored because we're so used to it? I think textiles have a lot of potential for complexity because they are systems. They have material components and structural components. And there is a depth to that hierarchy from fiber, yarn, textile. So my research, my experimental weaving practice is really about exploring that relationship. How can structure and material combine to create something that has behavior? that is transformative in itself. That's the end of my talk. Um, thank you all for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now and then I can see you all again. <laughs> I can all clap. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. And I think my brain hurts in the best way possible. Um, the linen experiments are really, really exciting. Yeah. Uh, Stephen will handle questions in the chat and bring them up, you know, as they come up. So that's a call for the community here uh, in the audience to write their questions in the chat. Uh, for those in the class, we'll have a little time after. But just to start, I wrote down all these um, kind of quick phrases you said, and I wanted to see which one you think resonates the most with experimentation. And so I just have two. One is you sort of continually mention textiles as a system. So is it systems thinking? Or the other one I really loved is you said it subverts sameness. Um, and so I'm wondering to what degree you might assign each of those terms to experimental weaving, which one maybe fits more or less, or are they different? I think they're different. I think both apply. Um, definitely, I mean, subvert sameness. That's what I'm all about. I want to do things that surprise me and that nobody's seen before, that people go, how did you do that? That's what I love. Um, 
I think if you if it works for my brain I'm I'm quite systematic I think you've seen that in some of the stuff I've showed you it looks insane but there is a system to it and so weaving because there is a hierarchy I don't really like to call it a hierarchy because that has certain implications but because there is a hierarchy because textiles have all these components you can definitely start to apply systems thinking and you can apply that in an experimental way I think maybe the way uh I think my initial reaction to it is like well that's you know like that's a structure but I think it can be used experimentally that was a great question, Laura. I'm not sure how to follow that. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. You know, we have a couple questions in the in the chat, and I'd encourage everyone else to drop your questions in the chat. Um, so, Catherine, I think a lot of people define zero waste really differently. Um, and so, there's I'm going to combine kind of two questions here. Uh, part one: How you know how do you define what a zero waste garment is? You know, people approach that really differently. And then part two: Since you know you're you're some of your really awesome um recent experiments what are some of the external applications you might think about or dream about for those specifically the um the square blocks here you know the non no so i guess this is the new no so uh garment yeah. <laughs> um so zero waste is it's holly's thing so it kind of came in as part of our collaboration um so it's not something it's not necessarily a, something I relate to very deeply. Um, I think in this context, in the context of the garments, it's about using the whole textile and building it out from the rectangle. Um, obviously with weaving, there is waste. You know, I don't think there is, there's no such thing as a zero waste system really. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not like, I work with the rectangle in weaving and I want to, I, would Laura said subvert it. I want to subvert the rectangle. I want to make the rectangle do other things. But I want to do it. I don't want to do that by cutting parts of it out if I don't have to. Um, applications. This is this is my perpetual bugbear. So I do applications when I'm working with other people, when they have applications for things. So like the garments, that is purely because of the collaboration. Um, I'm a I'm a problem solver. I want people to come with me, come to me and go, I think we could do this and let me fi figure it out. Like that's that's the way my brain works. Um, I think for me, I'm kind of part of the reason I'm almost a bit anti-application is because it starts to constrain things. In the textile field, it's very much about applications. And so it you kind of there's all these expectations around what it means if you're doing a particular type of textile and I want to kind of see what textiles can be if they're not you know something practical so that's my non-answer to that one somebody else can come up with it I'll I'll put ideas out there and then we can figure out what it should be together I mean I love that I mean I think that's really part of this conversation and why we're having these talks too is to think about people providing kind of you know inspiration for other folks connecting and I mean on that you know and I'm going to ask this is you know I'm the artist so I'll be the artist in the room so like you know I just see you know your work is so much about collaboration and I think that more in a and obviously I I think of weaving as a beautiful metaphor for collaboration always, right? Um, and so Catherine, you know, what are some of the ways in which you approach these collaborations, you know, outside of your field? Or, you know, I love the, I, I do love your thinking about what is experimental weaving. And I took some, if you don't mind, I took a screenshot of that and was like, I'm gonna think about this diagram. <laughs> Um, but what would you, you know, if you were to create this diagram or you to go back to this idea of like, you know, what is collaboration in this field? You know, how do you move that? Um, I know you you and Laura are collaborators, you know, how do you approach these things? And I'm sure somebody like you with your immense talents, there must be tons of people emailing you and be like, Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. So how do you know, how do you decide also which ones to take on and and where you might move through those spaces? Yeah. Um, so I don't have lots of people emailing me. Um, uh, projects, I've gotten projects because colleagues have been approached for things and then they've gone, Oh, Catherine does weaving. We should do this and weave it. Um, so a lot of it's about, I mean, it's that problem solving thing for me. It's like 
somebody has a context they think it might work in a textile or holly's life so i think we could take this idea and we could bring pattern into it and i'm like yes <laughs> you know i want to i want to draw new things out of what i already do um so one i mean a lot of it's about discussion and you know um holly karen and i wrote a paper about the planet city process because it wasn't just the three of us we were also working with the director and um, a costume designer so there was kind of this imbalance of power we were doing research they were looking for products um so some of that's about language even things like pattern in textile design pattern means surface pattern talking to fashion designers pattern means a cutting pattern so we kind of had to start to really align our language and then the paper models comes from holly because to explain things like she'd give me this this um kind of this artwork diagram of okay here are all the layers and i went to her at one stage i'm like look we're just gonna have to cut out this paper till i understand what's actually going on and make up the garment in paper <laughs> so that i can understand how it gets from this to that so I think these kind of these little models and um, Karen calls them figures of thought. They're kind of little ways of communicating that isn't necessarily verbal. That's really important. Um, it, I mean, everybody says that about collaboration, but it's true. Communication is 100%. I think with Laura, you know, um, it was a lot about little diagrams, sketching things out, um, trying things testing things going oh this doesn't work quite the way i was expecting it to so it's that that feedback and communication um yeah it's i in terms of collaborating with people outside my field um often it's about showing them what i can do so here are examples of um you know previous work here is what might be applicable to yours. Here are some diagrams. I've been I've got a project that's just finished recently and it was, you know, little sketchy diagrams, like this is why this is happening. Um, and then, yeah, just, yeah, that communication. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Catherine. Um, and I hope you guys heard that. There's a, if you need, uh, email Catherine immediately with your thoughts and ideas for collaborations. I think that's what <laughs> we were uh, asking for earlier. Um, just kidding, but please do. Um, so excited to have you here. Uh, we have time for one. I don't get some, some people are like, no, really, in the chats. Uh, we have time for one more question uh, before uh, Catherine goes to. We send this off to a private uh, chat with um, with Laura's class this morning. Uh, Laura, did you have another question uh, for for Catherine this morning? No, but I was excited about this question about. I'm going to push back on anti application uh -huh. because I do think that there's there's some interesting questions from Stacy in the chat about looking at these structures and not just seeing garments, but seeing shelters and spaces and sculptures. And so maybe how does that resonate with you in general about pushing pushing beyond upholstery and garments? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's where I'm. I'm interested in it's those alternative applications that other and again it's this thing of if other people can see something evocative in my work I'm really happy about it and then I'd be happy to loop that around and then work with somebody to make that a reality but it's a yeah I just um I've got you know I've got a colleague who calls them sculptural objects you know I can absolutely see some of them as a kind of architectural space type stuff like that's you know, I'm more than happy for people to see that in my work. I guess it's just that I'm so invested in the weaving and the textile part of it. I want to, I'm about what's it doing? What's its behavior? I think, you know, behavior is so key to me and the way I use this term and kind of what does it do? What is, why is it doing? That's what it's about for me. So I guess from what I'm understanding too, I think it's an interesting proposition in order to sort of open up one set of possibilities, do you feel like you necessarily have to close off another set? And I'm sort of saying this too, because the academic department we're in is very like application, application, make a demo, do a thing. So I'm wondering, you know, selfishly, can you talk about the benefits of sidelining application and what that opens up? Yeah. Oh, it is. It just gives you more freedom because you're no longer constrained by expectations. 
um, you don't have to think of what it's going to be beforehand. I think that's the problem with I, one of the problems I have with applications is you you're designing towards something, whereas I want to design outwards. I want to broaden things rather than narrow them down. Um, I'm really, really lucky where I am because they give us a lot of freedom as PhD researchers. You know, um, I'm not expected. Well, I've had questions about application, but I've been able to sidestep them. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> it is, it is a different context. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's a need for basic research. I think we've kind of lost sight of that you know, things like grant processes, it's all about, well, how, you know, Holly, I think it was Holly's uh, defense, somebody was asking, you know, well, how are you going to monetize this? And I'm sitting there going, don't understand, like, it's not about selling things, it's about building a base of knowledge. There's my rant, you can tell I get really... <laughs> well, I think that's also a really lovely way and sentence to maybe close off um, the talk. And I want to maybe turn it back to uh, the group to, to applaud or write in the chat or whatever the equivalent is in the virtual world. Um, but yeah, locally here, we can all do our clapping. Thank you so much. And, um, oops, yeah, go ahead, Steve. And folks, I just want to remind everybody that our next chat is going to be on October 19th um with just Jess, jesse lou i'm really excited about that as well there's a link uh to our so i'll just do all the things there's a link to our instagram a link to Catherine's instagram and a link to jesse's instagram all in the chat right now um and so we look forward to seeing all of you all here on october 19th um and as always email us send us your questions hit us up on the grams as they say um, as us millennials say hit me up on the grams uh and the gen z's go oh gross um, it's okay Catherine. thank you so much um i'm gonna hand this thank you for inviting me of course of course i'm gonna hand this chat over to dr uh devendorf laura's class sorry i keep calling you that just like your mom and thank you everybody for being here today Catherine. you should just see all the accolades in the chat that was wonderful i my loom is sitting over there and also heard this chat and they're like oh man Stephen's gonna go try to come up on me today. It's gonna be terrible. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. All right, Laura, I'm gonna hand this over to you.